A few weeks ago, Kent Hill and I had a meeting scheduled. Now, for those of you that may not know, Kent is a good friend of mine. He's also serving as the chairman of deacons here at our church, and so Kent had contacted me about a meeting. And uh, the bottom line is, we had to look at a lot of lines of rather meticulous characters, lots of sentences. It was a rather boring document that I had to look over, but it has to do with a project that our church is going to be involved with. And so what I would say to you is, you ought to be grateful that you have a pastor that's willing to look over such boring material to look out for you guys. And so Kent said to me, Pastor, I'm so sorry that you have to look this over. This is so meticulous and it's so boring. It's awful. So I thought I'd be kind of funny. You may not know this, but I have a sense of humor. And he said, Pastor, this is so boring. I hate for you to have to look at it. And I said, I thought I'd be funny. I said, oh, boring. You mean like a sermon? (laughs) And Kent said, no, it's not that bad. (laughs) (laughs) That's not funny. (laughs) I doubt that you'll be bored this morning, but I also doubt that you'll be happy either. I knew from the beginning of our Elephants in the Room series that this is the one in some ways I would be most looking forward to and most dreading at the same time. There are lots of reasons for my feeling in this regard. First of all, I don't want people to leave our church. I don't want people to leave our church. I certainly don't want them to leave our church angry or feeling unloved. So if you disagree with what is said, please know that I love you and we don't want you to leave, but also... Don't be angry with me based on what we conclude this morning. Fair enough? I'm going to try it one more time. (laughs) Fair enough? All right. Secondly, I know, frankly, that most people will not approach this subject with an open mind. And I readily submit to you, if I had but one sermon to preach before I would go home to meet Jesus, this would not be that sermon. In other words, people have their opinion about what we're going to talk about, and the mindset most often is, don't confuse me with the truth. So here's the way this is going to work. You've got at least a couple of crowds in the room. You've got the pro-drinking crowd and the no-drinking crowd. And uh, the pro-drinking crowd will be mad if we get to the point of saying that we think it's best for Christians to leave it alone, and the no-drinking crowd might be mad if we don't consign the pro-drinking crowd to hell by the time we're finished. (laughs) So I can tell you, nobody is likely going to be happy. We've already made lunch plans. We're not expecting an invitation. (laughs) Now, I recognize at this point, and the fact of the matter is, this will, in fact, change within a generation But I recognize at this point, most of the people in this church, most of you in this room this morning, are not in favor of marijuana for recreational use. I suspect there's a little debate about marijuana for medicinal use. I'm not going to go there. That's between you and your physician. But probably nobody here is going to say, look, my friends and I get together and we smoke a little weed socially. Nobody gets hurt. It doesn't harm my witness for Christ. I've been doing it for years and it hasn't affected me. I doubt anybody's going to say that to me this morning. Well, some, looking around, some of you might. But. <laughs> but a lot of people will use that very same line of thinking when it comes to alcohol. And they will say, it hasn't hurt me. My friends and I drink socially, and it doesn't harm my witness for Christ. Not here, not in our church, but previously I've had people say with a bit of a self-righteous edge, and by the way, don't ever be self-righteous in talking to your pastor. Pastors are always more self-righteous than you are. (laughs) And and they've said to me with a bit of a self-righteous edge, Pastor, haven't you read where Jesus turned the water into wine? And then, of course, I say, no way! (laughs) That's in the Bible? Where is that one? I must have missed that. No, I don't say that, for the record. (laughs) It's kind of like, though, the way unbelievers quote Scripture to me. They'll say, and you notice everybody always gets a little deeper voice, and then they go into the King James Version. I can't tell you how many unbelievers I've said, doesn't the Bible say, judge not, 
lest ye be judged. And that's usually when I'll say, haven't you read 1 Corinthians 2, 15, where Scripture says, the spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. That's in the Bible, you know. It is. It's in the Bible. So someone will say, with that self-righteous King James kind of tone, haven't you read where Jesus turned the water into wine? And I'll say, haven't you read what the writer of Proverbs says? Wine is a mocker, strong drink, a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. That's in the Bible, too. Anyway, we're winding down a series of sermons we've been in since 1963 <laughs> called Elephants in the Room, where we've talked about the authority of the Bible, the sanctity of life. We've talked about marriage, singleness, so-called gay marriage, divorce, remarriage, cohabitation, gambling, depression, suicide, the resurrection, heaven, and hell. We talked about homosexuality, racism, sexism, gender bending, money and giving. We talked about the discipline that comes from God as well as discipline from the local church. We have talked about social media and how we speak, creation versus evolution and eternal security, what it means and what it doesn't. We talked about wisdom for dating, grief, attitude during hard times, politics, gluttony, death, burial versus cremation, and sexual abuse, in particular, what the church can do about it. Now, even as I share that with you, it's hard for me to believe that that uh, paragraph I just shared sums up about the last year and a half of my life's work. We may get through this topic to today, but I doubt it. It's going to take probably one more week. We'll see. In addition to Scripture, I relied on several books in preparation for today that might be of interest to you. Let me share these with you. One that's written by an unbeliever named Craig Beck, and the book is called Alcohol Lied to Me. And then there's What Would Jesus Drink? What the Bible Really Says About Alcohol by Brad Whittington, and then Ancient Wine and the Bible by David Brumbelow, and then Should Christians Drink? written by Peter Masters, the man who now currently pastors at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, a place, a pulpit, once occupied by none other than one Charles Haddon Spurgeon. So elephants in the room, alcohol and marijuana, we find ourselves in the book of Romans and the 14th chapter, the 13th verse, it's page 949, if you're utilizing one of the Bibles there in front of you, and if you're able, I will invite you to stand, please, for the reading of God's Word. Romans 14 and verse 13. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding." Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Elephants in the room, alcohol and marijuana. Let me share with you a few statistics from a website. This is not a Christian website, by the way, but just a regular website, www.addictioncenter.com. About 30 to 40 million Americans smoke marijuana every year. The truth is, it's probably more than that. Statistics usually are on the lesser side. 
about 43% of American adults admit to trying marijuana. Now, we don't know whether that means they inhaled or not. In 2017, 1.2 million Americans between the ages of 12 and 17 and 525,000 Americans over the age of 26 used marijuana for the first time. In 2018, 13% of 8th graders, 27% of 10th graders, and 35% of 12th graders had used marijuana at least once in the past year. Less than 1% of 8th graders, about 3% of 10th graders, and about 5% of 12th graders reported using it every day. About 30% of people who regularly use marijuana have a marijuana use disorder. The average batch of marijuana in 1990 contained less than 4% THC. Now, this is important. That percentage has since risen to over 12%. The average batch of marijuana has become much more powerful, in fact, exponentially so. Drug overdose deaths have more than tripled since 1990. Do you think maybe there would be a correlation there? From 1999 to 2017, more than 700,000 Americans died from overdosing on a drug. Alcohol and drug addiction cost the U.S. economy over $600 billion with a B every year. In 2017, 34.2 million Americans committed DUI, 21.4 million under the influence of alcohol, and 12.8 million under the influence of other drugs. About 20% of Americans who have depression or an anxiety disorder also have a substance abuse disorder. More than 90% of people who have an addiction started to drink alcohol or use drugs before they were 18 years old. Americans between the ages of 18 and 25 are most likely to use addictive drugs. And then finally, about 28% of all traffic fatalities involve alcohol. 28%. These statistics are sobering, pun intended, and in many ways they ought to be convincing for us. In other words, that ought to be enough. But there's more that needs to be said, especially from the Word of God itself. Just one main point this morning. We were taught in seminary every sermon ought to have a point, so I'm going to give you one point. But I promise I will talk about this one point long enough. It might drive you to drink. Number one... Some gray areas become less gray when all the facts are known. Some gray areas become less gray when all the facts are known. Look with me again at the text, verse 13 and following. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide to never put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean. For anyone who thinks it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love by what you eat. Do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Some gray areas become less gray when all the facts are known. In context, we realize that Paul is here addressing issues related to whether or not believers in Christ, whether or not believers should be forced to abide by certain Jewish food laws. Paul is, in fact, going to be dealing with believers whose faith is strong and dealing with believers whose faith is, in fact, weaker. To Paul's point, he and other believers had complete freedom to eat exactly what they wanted. But they were also to be cognizant of how their freedom affected others, and they felt it was important not to allow their freedom to become a stumbling block to other people in any other way. So, what about Christians and marijuana? What about Christians and alcohol use? Well, the reality is a lot of Christians, in fact, I suspect most, if not all, of the people, even in this room this morning, would be quick to condemn marijuana use recreationally. But what about as it is legalized more and more? Are we only opposed to something because it is illegal? 
The reality is the same argument for alcohol is what will be used for marijuana. The same argument that Christians utilize related to alcohol is what will be used for marijuana. It's legal, they'll say. I don't overindulge. I have just one with my meal. It helps me to relax. And doesn't the Bible say something about God has given us all things to enjoy? Well, God doesn't want you to enjoy adultery, does He? So that's not carte blanche, everything. You have to understand the context. You recognize, I trust, that the Drug Enforcement Administration, that is the DEA, at least until recently, is still classified marijuana as a Schedule I substance, which they consider, quote, the most dangerous class of drugs with a high potential for abuse and potentially severe psychological and or physical dependence. What has just been quoted about marijuana could also be said in many ways about alcohol. It has a high potential for abuse, potentially severe psychological and or physical dependence. Other Schedule I drugs include heroin, ecstasy, and LSD. It's amazing to me that kids can't have Twinkies in school anymore because they are so bad for them. But in the not-too-distant future, they're going to be able to smoke weed in their house after school because it's not so bad. And it makes me want to ask the question that I posed to you about five years ago when I said, where are the adults in America? And you see, there are some things that many in our culture and many Christians would say are not necessarily problematic, but only potentially problematic. One of the things that makes something problematic, at least for a Christian, is how other people might perceive what we're doing. And make no mistake, when you signed up with Jesus, you signed up for that. How we live for all of our talk about freedom in Christ and the gospel being the only thing that, believing in that is the only thing that makes us right with God, and I believe that. There's a lot to be said with how we live our lives once we've believed in the gospel. And people are, in fact, watching. Paul makes it clear that we have to be careful about putting a stumbling block before others. In other words, we have to be cautious that our behavior will not in any way negatively affect other people, even if we feel the freedom to do what we're doing in the moment. And if someone takes offense at us or takes offense at what we're doing, Paul essentially says we are not loving our brother or our sister well. Now, I recognize this seems for a lot of people to be somewhat gray. But let's consider the facts. Think back to those statistics that I shared just a few moments ago when we began our little trek down this path. 28% of fatalities in alcohol or in, in car crashes are related to alcohol use. 28%. An estimated 10 to 16 million children under the age of 18 in the United States have to grow up in a home that is negatively affected by alcohol. So let's get the facts. When someone drinks alcohol, the rational faculty is regularly blurred and distorted, and the baser part of human nature is released. That's a scientific fact. There's nothing Christian or unchristian about that. When we drink alcohol, our rational faculty is dulled. We don't think quite as clearly. And the baser part of our human nature is released. The country music industry gets that. That's why they wrote the song, The Women All Get Prettier at Closing Time. <laughs> why is that? Because you're not thinking clearly. That's some ugly women. Send your email to tblack at Carney FBC. So while one may feel more relaxed after a drink or two, make no mistake, the mind is being dulled. As Peter Masters notes, and we've likely seen this, people drink because, quote, 
They want the mind, the seed of their anxieties, to be dulled. They want the lower instincts to be free. They want their feelings to be affected and their cares to be slightly anesthetized. This is, quote, a drug being directed against God's highest gift, the reason. People drink to dull something, to dull the mind, to dull the pain, to not think about whatever it is that might be bothering them in the moment, but they do that, and it dulls the mind, and make no mistake, it, it also ends up making the baser instincts of humanity more free. People don't go to bars just to socialize. They go to bars to socialize, to drink, to buzz, to get drunk, and to go home with somebody they're probably not supposed to go home with. In other words, alcohol causes us to give up, for recreational purposes, one of God's most important gifts to us, our ability to reason, to be sober-minded, to think clearly. Any of you guys have kids? Some of you, you're willing to admit that you have children? Good. It's great. I remember whenever I was a young man, my parents would say to me, son, only they would say, Kenneth James, make good choices. In other words, boy, use your head. You can't use your head the right way if your ability to think clearly is compromised. It's why we're not supposed to sign legal documents when we're taking certain medications or when we're under the influence of anything. So let's think about this, to think clearly. Do you realize the number of sexual assaults that would never have happened had it not been for alcohol? Think about the car accidents that would never have happened had it not been for alcohol. How many affairs would never have occurred had it not been for alcohol? How many fights would not have happened had it not been for alcohol? How much money would still be in somebody's bank account if they hadn't spent that money on alcohol? So you have to ask yourself, you really do, is, is alcohol really something that I should participate in at this point in human history, knowing the potential negatives and still expect to experience the blessing of God? Let's also appeal to Paul's words at another place, 1 Corinthians 6, 12. Paul says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Referring to activities that were not obviously immoral, Paul, the apostle, sets forth some boundaries about whether or not we should do certain things. He notes in 1 Corinthians 10, if you skip ahead, same kind of verbiage that he utilizes, that we need to see if something edifies, if something builds up others. Does the activity, in fact, have positive benefits? 1 Corinthians 10, 23, all things are lawful, there it is again, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his good, but the good of his neighbors. So we have to ask, does this build others up? Is this a helpful exercise? The truth of the matter is, in all of my years of living, I've never had anybody come to me and say, Ken, I just want you to know how unbelievably enriched my life has been because I've chose to utilize alcohol. Not one time. Now, I've had literally countless people in my office that have sat down with crocodile tears streaming down their face and say, I've got to tell you the story, and this is how it started. So is it helpful? Does it build others up? Let's get together and poison our bodies so that we can edify one another. Does that make any kind of sense to anybody? So when it comes to alcohol, which is legal, and marijuana, which is fast becoming legal, we have to ask, does this help others? Does this have potential to dominate me? And if the statistical data holds true, and I think it's probably on the low side, that two out of every 15 people who begin to use alcohol become problem drinkers, you have to ask yourself, will this potentially dominate me? 
Is this something that builds others up? Does my doing this bring good to my neighbor? In 1 Thessalonians 5.22, Paul writes, abstain from every form of evil for various reasons. Some translators translate this, abstain from all appearance of evil. The Greek word translated evil means harmful or damaging. Abstain from every form of harmful or damaging activity implied. So let's connect the dots here. Work with me, this is not a stretch. Is alcohol ever harmful? You're in church, don't lie. Is alcohol damaging? I've been a little bit, I shouldn't say humored because it's not funny, this coronavirus thing. I'm not making fun of that, I know it's a bad thing. And, uh, People need to take precautions, and if you want to fist bump or elbow, or somebody said this morning that we ought to do this like with our ankles. We couldn't do that because then people would accuse us of dancing, so <laughs> can't do that. But I've been a little bit amused as people have talked about this coronavirus. It's so terrible. Everybody's so worried about it. It's such a big deal. Listen to me very carefully. The statistical data will bear out that more people will be killed today, in all likelihood, in alcohol-related car crashes than will lose their lives entire, I mean, the entirety of all those who lose their lives with the coronavirus. And, and nobody's talking about this one. While biblical writers may have noted some virtue originally in imbibing low fortified wines that would cause one to lose his sense of reason, that wouldn't cause one to lose his reason rather quickly, these days I suspect that the same biblical writers would look at our alcohol drenched culture and they would say to believers, Are you crazy? Steer clear. What good does this bring into your life? Two out of every 15 that begin drinking will become problem drinkers. Would you have 15 snakes in your house if you knew two of them would kill your children? We already know biblical writers said some 2,000 years ago, they said abstain from every form of evil, the word evil, if the word evil can mean harmful or damaging, and if alcohol is at some level harmful or damaging, don't you think they would have something to say to the people of God about this today? (laughs) Now, I know a lot of people will say, but doesn't the Bible speak of drinking wine? I never read that. That's sarcasm for those of you that don't know me. Of course it does. And I'm not denying that for a second. But part of what we need to recognize as we ask these questions is that even some things that may not have been as harmful in other times may be very harmful these days. For example, nobody could go 70 miles an hour in a car in the New Testament era. Let me be clear, this is the moment of arrogance for me, okay? I'm not some backwoods, country, uneducated preacher telling you guys this in my attempt to control your life. I I have enough to deal with myself, much less trying to keep Lori under control. (laughs) I'm not about to try to take on your life. You're, you're basically adults. You, you talk to God about all these things. I'm not trying to do that. My point is, if I didn't believe what I am saying, I wouldn't be saying it. Because the fact of the matter is, the only thing I have to gain by sharing this with you today is grief. So you have to ask yourself, why would this guy mess up a morning by sharing all this stuff if he doesn't think it's true. And I know, I know, after this, nobody's going to invite me to lunch. I know that. I want you to be protected, and that's why I'm sharing this. Historically, for example, 
The highest achievable alcohol content of wines produced by ordinary fermentation, and that, by the way, was the only process available in, in biblical times, was around 14%. So during the days that the Bible was written, the worst case scenario in terms of alcohol content for the wine that we read about, worst case scenario would be 14%. That's the ceiling. But listen to me, in those days, wine wasn't even fermented normally to that degree because of the unpleasant taste produced by bacteria that they did not have the technology to eliminate, but that we do today. So, as Andre Bustanobi in his book, The Wrath of Grapes, not to be confused with the Grapes of Wrath, <laughs> gives a detailed examination of the ancient process of making wine. He concluded that alcohol abuse was not a major widespread problem in ancient times for ordinary people because stronger wines were more expensive and the commoner's wine was poor quality and literally of a lower alcohol content. Indeed, much of it never became what he would refer to as true wine at all. According to Bustanobi, it was just aerobically fermented must. So what is must, you ask? I'm glad you asked. You'll be glad to know your pastor knows all this stuff about the alcohol industry. <laughs> must is the juice of the grape which begins to ferment as soon as it is pressed from the grape. This must was left in open jars or in vats, to undergo aerobic fermentation, and in Palestine that would take only a few days, okay? The next stage was anaerobic fermentation. That's when the must was shut off from air or oxygen. This was hard to do in antiquity because of their porous containers and their poor stoppers. So the cheaply produced ordinary wines were stunted in development, sometimes lacking any anaerobic fermentation, which is what is really considered to be the birth, literally, of wine. So until the juice of the grape undergoes anaerobic fermentation, according to Bustanobi, it isn't really even wine. It's what he called new wine of a low alcohol content. Now, I know what you're saying. I knew he was going to figure out a way to explain this away, and he doesn't believe that the Bible talks about wine that could actually make people drunk. Of course I do. That is not to say one could not get drunk from this wine. In fact, as Peter Masters notes, the common wine of ancient Palestine was certainly fermented and no doubt intoxicating in quantity, but it was exceptionally and exceptionally weak product by today's standards estimated at being between 2% to 6% in strength. So the 14% that would be the ceiling in terms of alcohol content, that wasn't achieved because it would have made the wine taste terrible. So as Peter Masters notes, probably 2% to 6%. It's not until the process of distillation in the Middle Ages that the previous top theoretical limit of some 14% alcohol would immediately and exponentially increase. Listen carefully. These days in our culture today, gins and rums and whiskeys will possess 40% to 45% alcohol by volume. Think about the difference between 45% volume of alcohol versus 2 to 6% in the wine from biblical times. The process of distillation also led to the making of so-called fortified wines. These wines are further strengthened in alcohol content by the addition of distilled alcohol. Now, I could go on and on with this, but you guys get the point. It's not that people couldn't get drunk with the cheap wine of the day they could. It's just that by comparison to today's highly fortified alcoholic drinks, it really is a night and day comparison. So for someone to say, well, the people in Bible times were okay with drinking wine, therefore we should be too. That's like saying the Model T was great transportation and it's just like a Corvette. They're kind of the same but not really. So I started out by basically saying we know for a lot of people alcohol is a gray area. But even with what little time we've been talking about this this morning, let me ask, in our context, with all of the knowledge that we possess today, with all of the havoc we know that it wreaks upon our brothers and sisters and even those yet to believe, can you honestly say that you think alcohol use 
is a completely gray area for a Christian? See, I think some gray areas become less gray when all the facts are known. And by the way, when I see you at Price Chopper, don't jump in front of your cart. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Complete, own it. Own it. If you're an adult, own it. But what does it say? What does it say if you run into somebody that I'm assuming you have a modicum of respect for and you feel as if you have to hide what you're doing? I don't answer for you. I answer for me. Don't, you don't have to hide that from me. You're grown up. I'm not going to love you any less or think any less about you. I'm not going to confess my own stuff either. But what does it say if something we think is okay has to be hidden from people we say we respect? Some gray areas become less gray when all the facts are known. I've got more ground to cover on this next week because it is so much fun for me. <laughs> but the fact that so many people spend so much time and effort trying to rationalize and justify something that is proven, it's proven to be absolutely detrimental in our culture, that ought to make us, as followers of Jesus, think long and hard about what we believe and what we practice. That's what I'm saying. I'm not a big fan of abandoning tradition or long-held convictions. In fact, I think we do well to consider why our forebearers thought what they thought. Think about this. Even lost people in your circle of friends have an inherent sense that alcohol use is duplicitous with the Christian faith. I can't tell you how many times people through the years have said to me, but you Christians, I thought you guys didn't believe in drinking, trying to throw it up in my face because they've run into somebody at the church that's drinking. Lost people, people without Jesus in their life, have a check in their gut about us doing it. Why don't we have the same check? I'm not denying that we're free in Christ. We are. I'm saying you better be careful with your freedom in Christ. I know things have changed in our modern era, but I don't think all these changes are good. Peter Masters noted for the last 150 years, the overwhelming majority of Bible-believing Christians worldwide have been firmly committed to the practice of total abstention from alcohol. Only a relatively small proportion of evangelicals have demurred, reserving the right to drink in moderation. That's food for thought. Or shall I say, drink for thought. So let me give you a little challenge. Lean in. You say, it's not a big deal to me. Okay. Give it up for a month. Because here's what you'll find. If it's not a big deal for you, you can and you will. If you can't, or you won't, it is a big deal for you. So to close, let me appeal to a great theological platform for dialogue, Facebook. <laughs> you know, when you're preaching this kind of stuff, you gotta get the humor where you can. And I think, I think you'll understand my consternation about this Subject. This puts it in perspective on many levels. Someone recently posted, the early church wanted to know, what must I do to be saved? Today's church is asking, what can I do and still be saved? 